Uh, I know it's post lunch, that afternoon slump is kicking in, so I thought uh, I'll start with this visual uh, to like jolt you out of that post lunch lull. Um, I absolutely love this picture. I think it beautifully captures that chaotic energy that all of us developers have experienced from time to time. I mean, imagine the inside of that battlefield, the cries, the chaos, you feeling that everything is on the line. Well, that's how we felt sometimes when we were dealing with unruly business rules. And you might see more such visuals later on in the presentation, but rest assured, our story has a brighter and a happier ending, unlike the infamous finale of this web series. And that's, uh, that gets to my next slide, which is my talk. Uh, how did we embrace chaos at Poston and Bring? Uh, and how Kotlin Multi-Platform has been an, our, our ally in this journey. Uh, before we proceed further, I'm Anshika. I am a programmer. I have 12 years of industry experience, of which the past decade has been with Poston and Bring, uh, developing and like software which enables millions of people like you and I and thousands of businesses in and around Nordic to receive and send packages. And I stand here on behalf of an extremely talented team at Post and Bring. I, I would have loved the entire team to share the stage with me because it's been a team effort through and through. OK, let's just straight dive into the problem statement here. Complex world of logistics. I've not put Post and Bring there because I realized over the years that it's not a Post and Bring problem alone. I think logistics, like any other industry, is inherently complex. And to give you some context, I think you, have, you might have used Poston. Uh, you, might have, you see it every day around you. You might have heard of it. Some of you might have grown up with it, and rightly so. It's, we're almost 380 years old. Uh, we'll be in a few years. It's one of the oldest organizations in the country, maybe even in the world. And of course, the software hasn't been along for that many years. <laughs> But uh, it's been around for decades, and it's been worked on by a lot of different developers. So we can call it generational software. And that brings me, sorry. And that brings me to my next uh, slide. That's the complexity that we were dealing because of this generational software. So we started with the monolith, where we had all the business rules centralized in that monolith. Over the last decade, that monolith has been decomposed or broken down into multiple different apps. So what you see here on the screen is basically front-end apps, back-end apps, and everything in between. And you see the problem now, that X is representative of a business rule. We, and don't get me wrong, we are absolutely reaping the benefits of not having to deal with that monolith. Uh, but there is a catch here. We, don't have any, we didn't have any absolute source of truth for our business rules. And I think I can say, safely say for everyone else that that person there has been all of us sifting through millions of lines of code, trying to understand and make sense of what is in front of you. I mean, 60 to 70% of a developer's time is spent understanding code and making a mental map in your head. And that was our biggest challenge here. And also, there were some business consequences of not having a handle on our rules. If I demonstrate an example, we deliver dangerous goods, and then we have something called flexible delivery, which is basically, hey, I am not home, put it on my sidewalk, throw it in the backyard, so on and so forth. Now, these two services don't go hand in hand. But if, for some reason, this is misinterpreted or not implemented correctly, well, you'll end up with explosives on your sidewalk. Not that we deliver explosives, as far as I know. But you, you get the drift. And apart from business consequences, there was another price attached to this chaos. And that was just discontentment amongst the team members who had to deal with this code base. Everything is mentioned there, developer frustration, increased likelihood of bugs, and just high cost of developing any new feature in this code base. So what were we chasing? I hope Lord of the Rings fan in the room would appreciate that visual. Uh, that was it. I can say we wanted duplication to go take a vacation. I'm rhyming now. Uh, and also, like, 
yeah, just ha having higher confidence in our code changes. But at the crux of it all, we wanted to have one code base to run them all. Uh, exactly like one ring, but not to wield, uh, yield like evil power, but just to have some semblance of control over our business rules. So what we did is in 2019, we started plucking out business rules which were duplicated in all these apps locally, and we started dumping them in a Kotlin library, which was spitting out a JVM artifact, which we then used as a dependency in all the backend apps. So then at least that person heaved a sigh of relief in 2019 because then they had some semblance of control, at least for the backend APIs. And we enjoyed the benefits for a couple of years, but in 2021, we realized, hey, we didn't have any handle on our front ends because we need to validate everything in front ends as well. And we wanted somehow to use this library that we had created two years back to also do validation for our front end. And that's a nice segue into the talk. That's multi-platform. Now, before we see how we achieved that, uh, we need to take a little detour. I'm um, no deep dives because I don't have uh, time for that, and it's a huge subject matter. But I'll give you enough uh, information to, if you're not aware of this technology or have not heard of it before, you'll have a foundational understanding, and it'll also help you uh, correlate to the code snippets that I'll sh share in uh, later in the presentation. So let's start with basics. What is Kotlin multi-platform? This is a watered-down definition by our team. Uh, it's an open source technology which was developed by JetBrains and announced in Kotlin Conf in 2017. So it's been around for seven years. Simply put, it lets developers like you and I to write and share common code across different platforms. As simple as that. Let's unpack this a bit more, talk about what platforms are these, what are the most common use cases, and some technical jargon. If you talk to someone about Kotlin multi-platform, this would help if you know what these mean. So these are the platforms supported. We have the server side, which is what we are using it for. Uh, then we have the mobile platforms, iOS and Android, desktop and web, JS and Wasm. It's a huge list. So the next question is, now you know where all you can run that code, but what do you share? And that is a million dollar question. And I think that is where Kotlin multi-platform really differs from its contemporaries and it really shines because it's the flexibility for me. It's not a zero sum choice. It's not a binary. It's not, it doesn't require you to commit to a full scale migration. You can start really small. All of us know those pesky constants that we have duplicated in all the apps. Well, you can start there. You can just rip that out and put it in Kotlin multi-platform library. And like it says, it's not all or nothing decision with this. Now, most common use case, uh, unfortunately, our use case is not the most common use case that this technology is being used for in 2024. And the reason for that is, the most common use case is for mobile platforms. And the reason for that is that Kotlin, even though it's a server side, is seeing a steady increase as a server side uh, language in the recent years, but it's still predominantly used in Android development. So I think JetBrains just shifted focus in 2021 uh, to just focus on these. But it's working fabulously well for us as well. Now, even if I'm not an iOS or Android developer, but I am well versed with all these different layers, and even though I'm a web app developer, um, data core is basically you fetching data from either a database or an external service. Business domain is what I've been going on and on about in the last five minutes. UI presentation is you just uh, clicking through different views. Now, imagine without Kotlin multi-platform, you had to have three different repositories. And you had, just imagine the amount of duplication and overhead in maintaining three different code bases, which are exactly doing the same thing, but running on different platforms. With Kotlin multi-platform, you can, in principle, have one code base where you share all the three layers. And a disclaimer, more is not necessarily good here. So you do you. Like I said, you are not required to share all the layers. You can just share one tenth of one layer, but you can do it with Kotlin multi-platform. 
but you see here that the only uh, the only thing that you still need to write natively is UIs. So you need to use Swift UI for iOS, Jetpack Compose for Android, and so on and so forth. That comes to the next part, which is called Compose Multi-Platform. So I've added this because this, I feel, is a very ambitious project by JetBrains, where they've taken Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose, for people who are not Android developers, is just Kotlin. Uh, you write UIs in Kotlin in a declarative approach, as simple as that. So what JetBrains has done is it's taken Jetpack Compose and built this framework on top of it, which in theory would allow you to write your UIs in Kotlin for all the different platforms. So in principle, you can just have one code base which would run on every platform, and the only thing left would be platform-specific logic, which for obvious reasons you cannot have in the common uh, module. But it's still an experimental stage. Now, a little bit of technical uh, jargon, uh, modules. Well, you naturally your eye would be drawn to that shared module there. Um, it's basically a project structure of a common uh, KMP library. I'm just going to use the short form because we don't have time. Uh, <laughs> so you have three. You have common main. You generally have common main. That's the common module. And then you have, depending on what platforms you're building the app for, you'll have those platforms. In my example, you see iOS and JVM. Now, common main or common module basically has code which is common to all platforms. Then one would say, why do we need platform-specific module? Because when you're building that app, there are certain tasks, there are certain operations which require you to talk to platform-specific APIs. And Kotlin compiler, by principle, will not allow you to write code which is platform-specific in the common module. So that's why we have the platform-specific modules. And you can achieve that by a very good uh, mechanism they've introduced called Expect Actual. And I can ex explain that with an example. So suppose you want to, you've built an app, and you want to display the operating system, uh, the app uh, of the platform that the app is running on. So what you do here is, in common module, you will declare the platform agnostic function by adding that Expect keyword. And the actual implementation of this function, you can put in the platform-specific modules by adding that actual keyword there. And you see we are talking to iOS-specific APIs and Android-specific APIs to fetch that operating system out. Then we have something called targets. Uh, this is a developer telling the Kotlin compiler uh, by writing this DSL uh, in the Gradle build script. You just say that. These are the targets that I want the common code to compile to. And you, at the end, when you compile the whole uh, library, you get these uh, executables. For JVM, for Java, you'll get JVM class files or JS files or native executables for iOS and uh, Android. This, uh, for Java developers, uh, the analogy here would be your POM file or your Gradle file. Uh, this is basically all the modules that I talked about you need dependencies to compile that code. And source set is just a keyword that you put that, OK, for JVM common module, these are the dependencies. Like if you see this would resonate, you just put a JUnit uh, dependency here to write test cases for JVM test. So this is just a POM. It just has a fancy name here. And I want to wrap this uh, deep dive on steroids by uh, putting this uh, visual uh, out. Uh, all of this is from uh, Jet, uh, JetBrain's official website. I would highly encourage all of you to go read the case studies. Uh, some of the leading industry players are using it for a couple of years and with a lot of success. And uh, that is like seeing those names there, uh, the apps that we use daily gave us some confidence back in 2021 to dabble with it. And that's when also it just took off. Another visual that I have there, which I really liked, uh, was which layer is the most commonly uh, shared? Uh, this is from JetBrains, and that is the data validation and serialization. So which tells us that this is, again, not a post and bring problem. Uh, it is prevalent in the industry. So read those case studies. You might find your use case there as well. OK, then let's dive into the code. 
I fear uh, demo god, so I have snippets. Uh, no demos uh, today. So the first question you'll be asking, OK, what do I do? Uh, if I go out of this talk and I want to do a POC, how do I get started with this? The answer to that is simple these days. You go to this website, kmpjetbrains.com, and you either have a wizard or a template. You have marked these different platforms. You can just select you want to develop your app for, the platforms you want to develop it for. And boom, you just get a project structure out of the box. You don't need to worry about how to uh, uh, build this. It does it. The wizard or the template does it for you. And this is our project structure. So all you see the common main. So now hopefully that theory would help correlate with this code snippet. Uh, you see the common main there. That's where all our business rules like we dump our business rules in. So that is w where like you see country rules, product rules, tracking rules, all of those rules are dumped in there. And we have two platforms. Like I said, our team uh, doesn't have any native apps, but Poston has a lot of native apps. And there are teams who are dabbling with uh, both Compose multi-platform and Kotlin multi-platform for the apps that you use every single day for sporing and tracking. Uh, but our team doesn't have, own any native apps. So for us, it's for our front ends, that's JS main, JavaScript. And for our back end APIs, that's a JVM main. Let me explain what goes in those platform specific modules with an example. Now, we have a lot of fun methods uh, at work, but I chose a shipped by boat because why not? Uh, the rules aren't relevant. There are like a bunch of rules whether the shipment is allowed to be shipped by boat or not. But all those rules go in the common main. That goes in the common module. What you see here is these. we need these method, which are almost similar but slightly different in JVM main and JS main to expose that rule out to our backend and frontend APIs. Now, the difference that you see here is that the JVM main because Java allows for more complex and strongly typed code, you'll see that we use country enum. But that might not fly that well with JavaScript. So then we extract the code out of the enum, and then we pass it as a string. That's the difference between the two methods. Another thing, JVM static is not related to Kotlin multi-platform. It's just this code is written in Kotlin. So if you want to use this in a Java app, this just tells the compiler that this method could be called statically. But that JS export is related to Kotlin multi-platform. So JS export, that annotation basically tells Kotlin compiler, hey, this method, this class, this function needs to be compiled or built into the JavaScript library with all the TypeScript definitions and everything. So it acts as a bridge between Kotlin and JavaScript, that you can actually reuse this code in JavaScript. Uh, plugins and task configuration. So now we have seen the code. Uh, this is how this is this all this goes in Gradle build script. So you obviously need to put in a plugin for multi-platform. And like I said, we there's a code there telling the Kotlin compiler do not spit out native executables because we don't have any native apps. So we just want JVM and JS. And I'll show you how we tell the compiler to do that. And the other plugins that you see there, Maven and uh, Dev Petuska NPM publish. That's just for publishing these as library to Maven Central and NPM, just so that we can use these as dependencies in our front end and back end apps. Yeah, this is how we tell uh, uh, in the Gradle build script that this code that we have needs to be compiled. You need to spit out two artifacts and an NPM artifact and a JVM artifact. And this is how we tell in the, in the build script. Uh, yeah, just to uh, also summarize, so common main, all the rules are there. And then you add the JVM main and JS main. It gives, it spits out JVM artifact and NPM artifact. And then we have a lot of test cases testing all these three modules in that library. Using this dependency like any other dependency that you use. You just add it in your POM, in your Gradle script, or in your package.json like any other dependency, no uh, uh, fancy stuff happening there. How do you use it in your actual apps? Well, that's uh, self-explanatory. You just statically call that method, and we are passing the enum. Front end, because of that JS export, 
Now, is ship by boat acts as a normal JavaScript function that you can call in your front ends and then pass the country code, uh, the string that I mentioned in the definition. And one of the very good side effects of doing this, of course, we have that library which acts as a now rule engine to validate both our backend and front end apps. But we also generate JSON and XML from this library, which acts as an input to our developer site. So our developer site used to have rules like, what is the coverage area for that service? Is it from Norway to Sweden or yeah, all of that? And it used to be a, there used to be a mismatch between what our APIs were saying and what the dev site was saying. And we used to get a lot of feedback on that. But now our developer site is actually live documentation. So if I change the max, mate, max weight of a service, well, it reflects on the dev site as well. And our apps are validating the same thing. So yes, uh, have we demystified X? Well, I would say a resounding yes, uh, we have. It's no longer a wild goose chase. Uh, but is it all sunshine and unicorns and rainbows? Uh, no, uh, it's not. Uh, this is my uh, message on Slack last week to my product owner saying, hey, uh, this service locally says the coverage area is XYZ. And from the common lib, it says something else. Uh, why is this app still using the local rule? And what is the app truth here? So as you can see, there is a bit of a trek left for us. Uh, but we are not uh, wandering aimlessly now. We know where we want to get to. So yes, hopefully uh, this short uh, introduction to this concept uh, inspires you to untangle your spaghetti if you have uh, a similar use case in your uh, project. Uh, some. Some last uh, key ways, just start small. Uh, like I said, just start with those constants. That's what we did. Uh, iterate and improve, and just stay flexible. This, it might come across like that, but I'm not a spokesperson for JetBrains. Uh, neither was this a sales pitch. Uh, we're not married to this tool, but it's worked out really well for us uh, in the last few years. And we are running one of the most critical apps uh, for Postman uh, par powered by this. So if it works for you, Wonderful, but if it doesn't, there's always another way. Thank you for joining and thank you for listening to me. Thank you.